We're gonna look at Microsoft's income statement line by line. So I'm gonna show you how to do it. First, we go to Yahoo Finance, and you could just type in MSFT, the ticker, and it comes up. Or you could type in the name of the company, and a bunch of other Microsofts come up. The top one is what we want. It trades on the American Stock Exchange. But they also have Microsoft that trades on a Mexico Stock Exchange. They have a Microsoft that trades on a Frankfurt, Germany Stock Exchange. One that trades on a Buenos Aires Stock Exchange. And there's another stock exchange in Frankfurt, Germany. It trades on that as well. Let's go to the US one. Then we want to go to the financial section. And you can look at balance sheet and cash flow statement, but let's look at the income statement. And their reporting period ends 630, 2020. So this data is as of July 1st, 2019 through 630, 2020. And the total revenue are all the sales the company made for the past 12 months. And it includes all the sales from the computers and all the other products. The cost of revenue is how much money the company spent to generate that $143 billion of sales. The costs include the rent for the warehouse where the employees work. It also is for the payroll of the employees that made the products and also the actual physical products like the computer chips, the keyboards. That's all part of cost of revenue. And then gross profit is revenue minus cost of revenue and gross profit is 97 billion. Let's look at this in Excel so we can analyze a little more. So I have it up here, revenue, cost of revenue, gross profit. And you can see the revenue increased 20 billion from 2017 to 2018. Then it increased 15 billion, then it increased 17 billion. The cost of revenue increased 4 billion, 5 billion, 3 billion. So it's nice to see revenue increased, but you really don't know, did revenue increase at a greater rate than expenses? The way that you figure that out is you look at the gross profit margin. The gross profit margin is gross profit, 56 billion over revenue. It's how well you converted the revenue into profit. And they had 62% gross profit margin. That means 62% of the $90 billion was converted into profit. The other 38% was expenses. And in 2018, they improved to 65%. In 2019, they improved to 66%, and they improved again to 68% in 2020. That's what you want to see. You want to see a company becoming more efficient. And this makes sense because the more revenue you have, the more economies of scale set in. For instance, if you were buying computer chips, instead of buying 1 million computer chips, now you're buying 1.2 million, so you may be paying less per computer chip. Let me give you an example of how this may not work. Say, for instance, cost of revenue was $55 billion in 2020 instead of the $46 billion. And that means their gross profit margin was 61%. So obviously, they were not doing as well as they were in prior years. But just looking at the nominal values, you can see they increased their revenue $17 billion from 2019 to 2020, 126 to 143. And their cost of revenue increased $12 billion the 43 to the 55. So just looking at these two nominal numbers, you really can't tell, did they improve? It looks like they improved because their revenue is more than their cost of revenue, but you can't tell if they improved at a better rate. Looking at the gross profit margin, you can tell. The next part of the income statement is operating expenses. And these are all expenses not directly tied to making of the product. So you have research and development, and SG&A, Selling, General, and Administrative Expenses. Microsoft spent $19.3 billion in R&D in 2020. That's just how much money they spent to come up with new products, new designs to stay competitive. SG&A was $24.7 billion. So there's a lot of employees that work at Microsoft that do not have anything to do with making the products. For instance, you have your accounting team, you have your marketing team. The people marketing don't make products, they promote the products. So their salary goes in SG&A and all the materials they have to create for their presentations, those expenses are part of SG&A. And the offices, the headquarters and all the offices where those employees work, the rent 
for those offices are in SG&A. The rent for the warehouse where the employees make the products, that's in cost of revenue. Now let's look at the operating expenses in Excel. The R&D as a percent of revenue went from 14% to 13%. So that looks good. It's pretty steady. SG&A decreased from 22% as a percent of revenue to 17%. This is what you would expect. The larger the company becomes, the more efficient they become and the better they are at managing their expenses. Now operating income is your gross profit minus your operating expenses. You can see in 2017 they converted 25% of their revenue into operating income and it improved every year which is good to see. The next part of the income statement lists the interest expense, the other income, and the income tax. They had no interest expense in 2020 because they paid off all their debt. In prior years they did have interest expense so that's great. Not many companies this big have no debt. And this line, other income slash expenses, this is related to all income expenses not related to a company's main business. So to give you a few examples, sometimes companies buy bonds. So if Microsoft had a billion dollars in cash, instead of getting 0.1% interest in their bank, they may buy a $500 million bond that pays them 3% interest. So the interest they earn on those bonds or any investments goes here to other income expenses. Say they have a factory in Vietnam and it's getting too expensive to make product out there. So they move all of their manufacturing to China. So what they have to do now is sell that factory because they own it. So if they sell the factory and make a profit or post a loss, they have to put it here to other income expenses. So in 2020, they only had 77 million of other income. Prior years, it was much more. So you take the operating income minus interest expense, which is nothing, add your other income, and then you get your income before tax, $53 billion. And they have to pay taxes on this $53 billion. And they paid income tax of $8.8 .8 billion. So their net income in 2020 was $44 billion. Let's look at this in Excel. The top part here is the actual dollar amounts from Yahoo, but the bottom part is a percentage. And this is how you want to look at it as a percentage because it's hard to see if things are getting better or worse just looking at nominal dollar amounts. We could ignore interest expense because it goes down to zero and it's such a small number. Other income we could also ignore because it rounds to zero and it's also a pretty small number in prior years. The income before tax is improving because their margins are improving. This 8% of taxes in 2017, that's income tax. They pay $2 billion of taxes out of $23 billion of earnings. I didn't do it out of revenue. I did it out of earnings. So they paid 8% of taxes. But in the following year, they paid 55% of taxes. They paid $20 billion taxes out of $36 billion of income. Then in the next year, it was 10%. And then the year after that, it was 17%. So let's ignore the 55% for now. We'll get to it in a second. But everything else looks correct because the more money you earn, you're theoretically in a higher tax bracket. So you should be paying higher taxes. So it looks okay, the 8%, 10%, and 17%. I wouldn't question that. But the 55% is a big red flag. That's way too much in taxes. So that's something you want to look into as an analyst to figure out why that is. And just remember, the 2018 is not for calendar year 2018. It's for July 2017 up through July 2018. This news article says Microsoft paid $13.8 in taxes in one quarter. Microsoft never even paid that much in taxes for an entire year. It paid $9 billion one year, $4 billion another year, and $2 billion another year. And in one quarter, it paid $13.8 billion. What pretty much happened is the U.S. government charged a one-time tax to companies that keep a lot of money overseas. And Microsoft had $138 billion overseas, and companies do this to avoid taxes. The only other company that had more money overseas was Apple. So the government applied a one-time penalty to these companies. So it's good to see it's a one-time charge. It's also good to see it wasn't just Microsoft. Knowing this stuff helps because you do want to make investing decisions. And if this was going to be a recurring thing, that could affect the bottom line. Since this is a one-time thing, I think it's fine. And below net income, they talk about basic and diluted. Basic EPS is the earnings per share on the regular stockholders 
like me and you, if we own stock. So you take the net income, which is 44 billion, divided by the shares outstanding, 7.61 billion. But there are people who own securities that they can convert into Microsoft stock. For instance, debentures and warrants. So for example, I may hold a warrant that says, I can buy Microsoft stock at $220 a share anytime before 1231 2020 so obviously i wouldn't buy it for 220 dollars a share because it's trading at 205 i'd rather pay 205 but the price went up to 230 i may buy it for 220 and then sell it for 230 or if the price went up to 230 i may wait because it may go up higher so if all the people who own convertible securities actually converted them they would have 7.683 billion shares outstanding. If you own Microsoft stock today, your earnings per share were $5.82. But investors want to know how much lower their EPS would go if their shares were diluted. Because every time somebody exercises their securities, it dilutes the current shareholders. And it's good to see their earnings per share increase from 274 to 582. And if somebody asked you, do you know why Microsoft's earnings per share dropped? from 2017 to 2018, you can say it was a one-time tax charge of $14 billion. You never want to see a company you're investing in to take a big hit or a penalty of $14 billion, but I'd rather see them take a $14 billion one-time tax penalty than if their operating system had a lot of problems in it, with it and they had to spend $14 billion in recalling products. That's so much worse. And the last thing is EBITDA which is earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortization. And EBITDA is a non-GAAP item. So GAAP is generally accepted accounting principles, and companies are required to report certain things in their financial statements. But they're also allowed to report non-GAAP items. So companies do report additional items on their income statement to give investors more information. Sometimes GAAP financials don't fit every company, so it's not providing the information the company wants to convey to its investors. So it reports additional information, but it has to reconcile the non-GAAP to the GAAP. I hope you learned something new today. Thanks for watching the video. Please leave a comment.